So hi everyone, you're joining me for a very special interview. I got an email from the one and only Jim Keller a couple of weeks ago saying, hey Ian, we want to talk about Tens Torrent. So for our first interview of a pair, today with me I have the CEO of Tens Torrent, Lubija Bajic, and the man, CTO Jim Keller himself. Now Tens Torrent is a 2016 AI company startup. Uh, they manufacture chips specifically for AI compute. They've done a test chip, they've got a chip out in the market, and it's the really this next generation chip which is really going to blow the socks off for the guys at Tens Torrent. So CEO uh, Lubija Bajic, he's uh, you know, 12, 14 years AMD uh, veteran, uh, CPU design, power design. He's, he met Jim Keller. Jim, as you know, has worked at uh, Apple, AMD, Intel, PA Semi, Tesla. And now he's at Tens Torrent, and he was actually one of the first investors, which I'd like to go into as part of this interview. So please join me in welcoming uh, Jim and Lubija for the interview. Hi, guys. Hi, Ian. Hey, Ian. Good to see you. First question to to come up is, uh, what exactly is, is is Tens Torrent? I mean, I know I've given like a small overview there, but you guys have been around for, for five years now. You've got some, got some funding. You've got some chips under your belt. So who or what exactly is Terrent, Tens Torrent? Uh, so, uh, as you mentioned uh, a little bit ago, Tenstorrent is a startup company working on new computer architectures uh, that are aiming to essentially be the right substrate for executing machine learning workloads and more data-heavy workloads that have been emerging and kind of taking over uh, on the the sort of especially data center computing scene, but probably wider than that as well. And Jim, you 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 were the first investor in Tens Torrent. I, mm -hmm. I I it's I remember you telling me a little while ago when you first because you've joined the company. You've been there what four months now? It's, four or five months. Yeah. 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 So yeah. so what is it about Tens Torrent that's really re really got you excited and interested? Well, so I, I knew Labija, and he's one of the I, I'd seen a lot of AI startups, and then when I was at Tesla, everybody you know came to talk to us and pitch their stuff. And there seemed to be, you know, an odd collection of odd ideas and then people who didn't really get, you know, the full end of chip design, software design and all that. And I know Lubija, like he'd actually worked on GPUs and real chips and he's run a software team and he actually understands the math behind AI, which was a, a somewhat rare combination. And I also told him I thought it would be funny if he and a couple of guys were working in the basement for a year. And uh, so I gave him the... I guess what's called the angel round, and uh, and they they actually did. Were you in a basement or you were over a garage or something? We we were in a basement. You were literally exactly. in a basement. So, and they built a prototype a prototype using an FPGA that got them the, the seed round, and then that got them further to get the the first A round. So, so 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 was that the basement in Toronto, Labija? As, as far as I know, you're based in Toronto. Yes, it was the basement of, of my house, essentially. The, the same basement I'm sitting in right now. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> You've come far. I'm full circle. <laughs> yeah. Five years and, later, I'm still in the basement, Jim Jinx. Well, and the other thing, Ian, um, I told him, make sure you're, whatever you're building always has software to run on it. Because there's been a number of you know, AI efforts where they build a chip. And then they say, well, now we're going to build the software. And then they find out the hardware software interface is terrible. And, you know, it's difficult to make that work. And I, and I think they did an interesting job on that. Even, even though, like, I was talking to our compiler guys, and they're basically doing the third rewrite of the software stack, which is actually great. Because the hardware is pretty good for software and had an idea. And, it, you know, got a certain point, And then they re rewrote it. And the new rewrite is actually beautiful, which I think in the world of AI software, there's not much beautiful AI software down that talks to the hardware. So I'm it's, pretty it, it, in my past, I always remember that writing the software the second time was always a lot better because you understand how it worked, yeah. whereas the first time was always exploratory. But uh, c c c come back to Libesia in the basement. It's so <laughs> Tennis Torrent has three co founders. Was it just the three of you in those early days? So uh, it was two of us for the first few months. Uh, then, uh, then our third co-founder joined us. 
uh, right around that time, Jim made the the investment into Tenstore and kind of making the the whole thing a, a little bit, a little bit more legitimate and a, a little bit less pipe dream. So a few months after that, we 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 moved out of out of the basement and got an office, which was a again a very prototypical, you know, really kind of low low end office in a bad part of town with shootings. <laughs> kind of story in Toronto. <laughs> yeah, in Toronto. you have to look for a bad part of town in Toronto. <laughs> so so we were there for a while. It was a lot of fun in retrospect. So I mean, you, you'd spent you know best part of a decade at AMD, a little time of Nvidia. What made you decide to jump and form your own startup? Uh, well, uh, I really wanted to to build a a next generation computer, which was going to leave a leave a dent of some kind on 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 the computer scene and. Uh, as much as the the problem materialized, which was which was machine learning, by so I started Tenstorrent in 2016, and by then it was clear that this was a huge workload, that it was going to be a major upheaval, that it was going to be an internet grade, you know, perturbation to 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 our common space. Uh, it's difficult to make you know very sort of large departures off of what's already there at at big companies. Uh, so. You know, like I, I guess uh, that that that's part of it. The the other part of it was that you know, like just co- to due to completely un- unrelated reasons. You know, like I decided to move on and, and and see what to do. And like you put the two together at some point. You know, Tenstorm got uh, conceived of as an idea. It was very wobbly at first. So like the first month or two of thinking about it. Uh, I was very uncertain that it was really going to go anywhere. And the thing that really kicked it over was that Jim showed trust in the idea. He showed trust in my ability to do such a thing. And like really in a very real way, if Jim hadn't invested, I don't think, you know, I would I don't think we would have really gone forward. Probably I would have just gone on to get another job. So, I mean, you, you, the two of you met together at AMD, working <laughs> on projects together. Uh, it's, I'll, I'll start with uh, you, Jim. What's your first? Im- what was your first impression of Labija working with him? Um, he's a big hulking guy, so we're in this meeting, and you know, you know, all these nerdy engineers are talking, and then there's Labija, like basically saying, "This is how we should do stuff." You know, he's a let's say a fairly forceful personality, and he'd done a whole bunch of work on improving power efficiency of GPUs. And let's say when uh, he first proposed that there was a bit of pushback, and then, and then he slowly they slowly worked it out, and he was right, which you know, and I think Roger Godori actually told him later on that a lot of the power performance improvement they got came from the work he did, and then he took over a team of with software power power management system management, which had been sort of glommed together from a couple different groups and it wasn't very functional and they. He did a fairly significant transformation of that in terms of charter and also effectiveness. And so I was kind of watching this go on. And um, when I was at AMD, like the products they had weren't very good. And we literally canceled everything they were doing and restructured stuff and created a bunch of clean slate opportunities. Like Zen was, well, at the top level, literally a clean slate design. And we reset the CAD flows. Lubija was resetting the power management strategy and a couple other things. So he was one of my partners in crime in terms of like changing how we do stuff. I don't think you were a senior fellow. I, I found the best senior fellows at AMD. At least I thought they were the best and they worked for me and I had a little gang and then Labija joined that gang because everybody said, yeah, he's, he's one of us. And it was pretty cool. And, and then together we could basically get any technical problem moving because we had pretty good alignment. So that was really fun. So, 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 so same question to you, Labija. I mean, he, 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 here's Jim, a well-known name in the industry for semiconductor design, coming into AMD, you know, kind of laying down the hammer, saying, you know, let's rip everything up and start clean slate. What was your, what was your impression of him at that point? Well, on, on, on my second shot at, at AMD, I, I rejoined the company, having explicitly decided that I was going to, essentially apply whatever energy I've got to kind of fixing everything in my site and like 
<laughs> pop at nothing. And really, I joined with that mindset. Uh, and I didn't know Jim at the time, but pretty pretty quickly we pretty quickly we intersected. And also pretty quickly it became clear to me that on on my own, you know, regardless of my you know enthusiasm and desire to to make a lot of impact, it's it's going to be difficult to to sort of get around all the obstacles that you, you generally, you know, come upon when you want to affect a lot of change in a, in an, in an organization that's, that size. Right. And my, my first impression was that, uh, you know, Jim, Jim, Jim was essentially, uh, absolutely bulldozing through anything that you could characterize as, uh, <laughs> as any kind of obstacle, whether it was, you know, like, uh, organizational or technical, like literally every problem that would land in front of him, he would just sort of, you know, drive drive right over it, and like you know, with with what, what seemed like no uh, no no sort of slowdown whatsoever. So, give, given my disposition and and what he was all, all already doing, like I think that's that's ultimately what, at least a part of what led to us mm-hmm. getting into alignment so quickly and me getting into this group that Jim just mentioned. I think I was I, I wasn't a, a senior fellow. I was actually a director. I think every, everybody at the time kept saying that you know, like nobody understands why I'm a director and you know, like uh, why am I not a fellow or a senior fellow? And there there was a common theme there. But I guess I I fit in more with these technical folks. And uh, that said, there, there, there's a lot of organizational you know challenges to getting anything serious done. So I thought that you're better positioned somewhere where you you have a bit of reach into both. But for, for me, the biggest, I, I guess, the initial, initial impression was that Jim enabled everything that, that I wanted to do and basically recognized, he, and he did this for anybody, you know, that was in his orbit, right? He's, he's extremely good at picking, you know, pe- people that can get stuff done versus people that can't, and then essentially giving them whatever backing they need to do that. And mm-hmm. that's really a large chunk of what led to success for us there. As we got to know each other, he started giving me all sorts of random advice, right? Like so, like this sort of stuff, like uh, <laughs> you know, uh, the the story with uh, with uh, that that I mentioned before with my memory is that we had a meeting in in Austin one time, and I was supposed to fly on Tuesday morning. I I went and checked, like went to check in early, and realized that I'd booked a ticket a week earlier, right? Like so, <laughs> I never I never went to the airport. I never like you know I didn't have a hotel. I didn't have a flight. So I called up Jim and I'm like, look, man, I got to buy another ticket. And, you know, like I can't go through the corporate systems because I need to buy it like now. And the flight's at 6 a.m. the next morning. So he goes, yeah, you know, like you you should really watch out for that. Like you're kind of too young for, <laughs> for this sort of behavior. Since then, I've gotten all sorts of life advice for him, which, which I've also, you know, felt was extremely useful and impactful for me. Right. So like I've, I've actually changed major major things in the way I go go about doing stuff that's got nothing to do with computers and processors mm. based off of Jim's input. Yes. So yeah, I guess he's been a huge influence. Started with work, went into other stuff. It's for for for, for the time at AMD, it kind of kind of sounds like sounded like a it was Jim's way or the highway, so you better fall in line. No. No, I wouldn't no. say that. So I disagree with that too. So, so okay. the, the funny thing was, is we knew we were kind of at the end of the road. Like our customers weren't buying our products and the stuff on the roadmap wasn't any good. And I didn't have to convince people very much about that. There was a few people who thought, well, you, you don't understand, Jim. We, we have an opportunity to make 5%, but we were off by 2x. And you, you couldn't catch up. And I made this this chart that said our plan was to fall a little further behind Intel every year until we died. And so we're, with Zen, we we're going to catch up in one generation. And there was sort of, you know, three groups of people, a small group believed it, you know, a medium sized group thought, well, if that happens, that would be cool. And then another group definitely believed it was impossible. And, and a lot of those people laughed and some of them kind of soldiered on despite the disbelief, you know, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance, but I found all kinds of people that were really enthusiastic about it. Mike Clark. It was the the architect of Zen, and yeah. he and I made this list of things we wanted to do. And I said, well, "We did this; would be great. Why don't we do it?" He said, "We can do it." Well, why aren't we doing it? He says, "Everybody says it's impossible." It's like, well, I'll take care of that part. <laughs> so, but it wasn't just me. It was, you know, there's lots of people involved in 
you know, moving it. But also getting rid of people, not getting rid of, getting people out of the way that were blocking it. And uh, so it was fun. Like I said, you know, computer design needs to be fun. And, uh, and well, I, I mean, gave a talk to where I tried to get people kind of jazzed up about what we were doing and, you know, made fun of them in public. And I did all kinds of crazy stuff to, you know, to move, get people out of that kind of desultory, you know, hopelessness that they were falling into. So. I mean, I, uh, I recently put a, uh, a small segment of your scaled ML talk in one of my videos, and mm -hmm. I got a lot of comments on there because you used Comic Sans as the font. They ah, thought that right, was absolutely right. hilarious. <laughs> you know, well, a non-standard engineer, right? That was uh, a friend of mine's idea. Thought, she thought that would be really funny, and to be honest, I didn't really know why, but I've gotten a lot of comments about that. <laughs> like, well, it was one of the comments is like, I'm so badass, I can use Comic Sans. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I just thought it was funny. And uh, yeah, it was good. That was so, a strange um, talk too, because they didn't tell me it was, I walked in the room and it was all bankers and investors and university bureaucrats. And it was like, they told me it was a tech talk. And I thought, oh, well, <laughs> here we go. The title of your talk was TBD. I thought that was sort of kind of like an in-joke. <laughs> It was, you know, it was the future of compute, so let's call the talk TBD. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that might have been an end joke. But uh, speaking of something fun, so Tens Tyrant 2016, I mean, at the time, Jim, I think you were working on Tesla, on the self-driving mm -hmm. yeah. stuff. When you were speaking with Lubija at the time, you know, was mm -hmm. did Lubija have a concrete vision at that point? You know, was it was was there something more than just, who Labesia is that, you know, gave you the impetus yeah. to invest? Yeah, there was a couple of things. One is um, we're all in that process of discovery then about just how low a precision mathematics you needed to make neural networks work. And he had come up with a, a fairly novel um, variable precision floating point that was really dense per millimeter. And then he had an architecture of compute and data and then how we wanted to interconnect it, which I thought was pretty pretty cool. Um, he had pretty strong ideas about how that worked. Um, Pete Bannon and I talked to him a couple times while we were at Tesla. The engine he was building was actually more sophisticated than we needed. And we, yeah, the, the, you know, Pete was the architect of the AI engine and the Tesla chip. And it's brilliant for running CAFE. Um, just amazing. Like the, the compiler team for that chip was a half of Pete. Like literally. Yeah. Like it's and because, again, the hardware-software match was so good, CAFE produced a pseudo-instruction set, which he trivially modified to go run on the AI engine. And what Lebesia was doing was more sophisticated to run uh, lots of different kinds of programs. And Lebesia, at the time, were you already aiming at PyTorch? Or or were, that was before PyTorch was the winner. It was probably TensorFlow back then. Yeah, PyTorch was just called Torch, still right. in. And... Uh, TensorFlow had just kind of started being hyped. So C Cafe was really the dominant framework right. at, at the time. And then TensorFlow was on the horizon and PyTorch was not quite on the horizon right. as, as but, a dominant. But Cafe could describe more complex models, especially when you go into training. And the engine we wanted at Tesla didn't do that. So we built a simpler engine. Um, but he was already off to the races and he could, you know, show benchmarks and show good compute intensity. And, you know, you guys had a hacked up version of software that actually did something useful. And you seem to be paying attention to the hardware software boundary, even way early on the design. And I thought that was, that was key. Yeah. We had a box that we were taking around and showing everybody in June, June, 2016. And he was running, neural networks end to end from cafe on an FPGA and returning results. And, uh, so it wasn't anything that you could sell, but it, it showed that, you know, like, uh, we, we could basically bring up this thing end to end relatively quickly and that we had a bunch of ideas. I mean, ultimately all of our key focus, uh, focal points even now are essentially stuff that we, we wanted from the get go. So it's, it hasn't been a huge evolution in, in, you know, high level thinking since then, it's been more just like a massive amount of execution. 
so that that actually leads into into a question about execution because you started off with this proof of concept jawbridge design in 2019. We've got six ten six cores, small one and a half one. I think you you classified it as. And now you have a bigger uh, next gen chip called Grayskull, 120 cores, PCIe four, and it's 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 shipping to customers this year, I think. But yeah. mo- most recent AI startups don't really publicize their proof of concept designs. So can you explain why it was important to have this, you know, fast follow on from the uh, you know first mini chip to uh, Grayskull, which is now being sold? So so there there, there were two reasons why we why we went about you know our product roadmap the, the way we did. One was purely risk management. So it was, you know, new new team, no existing flows, no existing anything. We really had to flush the pipe and, you know, get something built so that all of the linkage of which there's, there's you know, like literally 50 steps that you need to kind of put in place to get that done can can be done and, and we have it all working and we don't run a, a risk of sinking a pile of money in case there's a mistake. Uh, the the other motivation was that we believe pretty deeply that it's important to have the same architecture basically span from edge to to huge multi chip multi computer deployments in the cloud and the the main reason why we think so is that as you go away from just running through a bunch of equations to implement a neural net and you get into more fancy things like runtime sparsity or dynamic computation or Anything that tries to go away from the mindset of just crunch a bunch of multiplies, you know, the same multiplies every time, uh, you naturally run into compatibility dynamics. So we felt, so you end up with a situation where if you train something on, let's say, an NVIDIA GPU, and it has a, you know, 2x sparsity feature in case you apply a certain set of constraints to your data, if you don't have a compatible piece of hardware wherever you deploy this, so in a phone or, you know, like an edge device, uh, you lose that 2x, right? And the 2x is just going to grow in in our uh, view anyway. So essentially, we felt it was a huge advantage to be able to clearly demonstrate that we can do a single watch chip, we can do a you know 60 watch chip, and we can do a data center full of our chips connected through through Ethernet that's also on our chips. So when you look at this spectrum, the single watch chip was the easiest to do. So you know, like it was it was another point in favor of doing it. So we, we basically just went, it, it's, you know, a, a much less verbose way of saying this. It's kind of crawl, walk, run, yeah. uh, but shows the whole spectrum. Yeah, and also, possible. you know, a lot of people spend a boatload of money on their first try. And, mm. you know, Grayskull is our third generation. We had a prototype in an FPGA and then a test chip and then yeah. Grayskull. And they learned a shitload on each step, both hardware and software. And it's reflected in the software stack. Like our software team is pretty small. I've seen a lot of software where AI companies, you know, they get a chip back and their plan to make it work is to hire 300 software people, right? Which means they don't have a plan really. Um, and, you know, that you can't really overcome that mismatch, mismatch in hardware software boundary with, you know, huge teams. Well, at some level you could, if you can throw a thousand people at it and some people are doing that. But, but that's not really the right way to do it. And that's not going to be something you could expose long run to programmers because the, the complexities are so high, it gets really fragile, right? And then the programmers can't see how the hardware works. Like one of the geniuses of Linux and open source software and running on x86 is the programmers could program the hardware right to the metal. Yeah. And they could see how it worked and it was obvious and you know, it was robust and it worked over time. And AI hardware that's too fragile to be exposed to the programmers, like the, not not all the programmers, but you know the experts. As you've said, the, na- the na- nature of AI is you know changing, and you have you end up with a scalable system, but that scale also has to go between inference and training. And we're seeing you know a lot of AI startups decide to go down one or the other inference because it's easier to build the chips and arguably cheaper training is a lot harder to organize and currently you know grayscale seems very much like an inference design so with so many companies sort of targeting the inference market how much of a success has it been you know how what's the pickup rate between companies evaluating the chip versus actually deploying it in their infrastructure well we're going to start you know we're we started production but there's a lead time on that so our plan is 
know, really starting Q3 and 4, we've talked to a whole bunch of people. And when we show them the benchmarks and, you know, how it works, you know, they're excited, but they're all in the mode of, great, you know, give us a box. You know, when we can run it and do it, we'll, we'll see the pickup on it. Um, on the inference thing, Labija, what was your number? It was sort of a, we could have made the chip about 30% more efficient if it was inference only, maybe 20%. And that delta is small enough that if you're going to say, I'm going to go deploy a whole bunch of AI hardware, and you have to have two different sets of hardware for inference and training, then that efficiency delta is too small to justify the lack of capability. So um, I think we did a good thing. Grayscale can do training. It's, it's going to benchmark really well on that. And um, with the sec next generation after that, we have more networking between chips so we can scale up bigger and better. But they're, they're fundamentally the same architecture. A number of the AI startups, you know, they're focusing on, you know, say, ease of deployment, that software hardware mix, but uh, you know, simplified code installation. We've got a company doing single core designs, going for peak tops per watt or consistent you know, batch one performance. Mm -hmm. Is there something about Grayskull right now that, makes that the inference chip of choice for customers against all the competition? So purely on technical metrics, I think it's it stacks up very well, uh, you know, it, it, versus other other options uh, that are available out there. Uh, the, the one thing that Grayskull can do, uh, which I believe at least most, most of the alternatives that, that I look at can't is uh, essentially in the realm of uh, uh, Conditional computation, uh, dynamic sparsity handling. So things to to um, to make an example. If if you're doing training, for example, today for the most part nobody can uh, use sparsity at all. So the the way gets sparsity sparsity gets used usually is you train a chip with no assumptions. Uh, you train a model with no assumptions on sparsity. Eventually you post process it. Uh, after the fact, then you you make a lot of weights for the model zero, and be it becomes kind of a sparse model for for uh, inference, so we're able to to use sparsity to a lot of gain dur during training. For example, uh, even during inference, where most folks focus on these weights, where there's a, a trade-off in how many you're going to prune out and make zeros, and what kind of quality you're, you'll be left with after after doing that, uh, we're able to make use of sparsity in intermediate results, in activations, in basically stuff that's not fixed at known at compile time, like, like weights for, uh, for, for inference. And then finally, we're able to do uh, relatively programmatic stuff in the, in the neural network compute graph. So we're very good at having a bunch of heavy math, like matrix multiplies or convolutions or whatever, followed by a node that does something that's completely, completely programmatic, right? So it's, it's not math heavy. It's a sort, it's a general program. Every one of our cores has a, uh, uh, has a set of risk five uh, you know engines in it which can basically run uh, whatever you want uh, on them so we believe pretty deeply that as neural nets continue evolving both the dynamic sparsity and conditional computation as well as this kind of program in the graph kind of story are gonna be getting more and more important primarily because uh, you know just putting in a bunch of expensive math has led the largest models of today to already be data center sized and uh, the, the the scaling with with no smarts is kind of difficult to sustain so i mean ha ha having this sort of co conditional computation in each of your cores you're sacrificing a, you know a few uh, compute per millimeter squared essentially but you get that more flexibility within the compute stack within the model application right I mean, uh, you, you get the flexibility, definitely. Uh, adding programmability isn't free, as, as usual, so, so there's, there's a bit of sacrifice there. But when you look at the, uh, you know, the raw numbers, uh, the, let's say the area of those risks uh, compared to, to the rest of the block is sub 5%, right? P power, same kind of story. So ultimately, if you play your cards right, what you pay doesn't have to be, you know, hugely noticeable in the in the pie chart of everything that goes into this design and we think we struck a good balance so in terms of the customer base just get a sense here what sort of verticals have been analyzing 
uh, Grayscale so far? Government, commercial, uh, data center, you know, recommendation engine type stuff? Yeah, I think there's another way to look at it. So there's, you know, the three big areas of AI today are like image processing, language processing, and recommendation, right? And then there's this kind of like movement from, you know, convolutional networks to transformer networks, right? And everybody's using the same building blocks. And then what we've noticed is a lot of people go aim at the big hyperscalers, but they can't deploy you until you can sell them a million parts, right? And right. they don't want to buy a million parts until they see a proof point of 100,000. And you can't get there until you do 10,000. So we've, we've talked to a whole bunch of people, you know, top to bottom in the stack. And they're all interested. The ones that are easiest to talk to that are going to move the fastest are like AI startups or research labs inside big companies that own their own software and they they understand their models and do it and you know our initial target it isn't to get some huge contract it's to get 100 programmers using our hardware programming it and you know living with it every day like like that's what i want to get to in the short run and that's that's basically our initial plan but <clears throat> they're fairly diverse people we're talking to you know there's autonomous you know control system kind of people, there's image people, there's language people. Uh, there, we were building this cool recommendation engine which has an extra board in the computer with a huge amount of memory to make that model work. Um, so it's fairly diverse, but we're looking for people who are agile as opposed to a particular vertical. So, I mean, uh, go, going from, they say, 1,000 units to 10,000, 100,000 to the million, um, mm -hmm. You obviously need an architecture that scales all the way through, from yeah. you know edge to cloud, uh, as, as I think uh, you know Labisha said earlier. Is this what you mean by when you say Tens Torrent is the most promising architecture out there? I mean, I want to get onto you know the next generation wormhole design, which is what I think you're talking about specifically when you mean that. But can you can you go into a little bit more detail? No, I I would start with so. Like we have a compiler stack that says take Py PyTorch generates a graph and then the graph gets paralyzed into smaller chunks. And then those chunks have to coordinate between their computation and then they execute kernels. Right, that's the basic flow everybody's doing. We have a really nice hardware abstraction layer between the hardware and software to make that work that I really like. And let's just think about, so people say, I'm making this really big matrix multiplier. The problem with that is the bigger it gets, the less power efficient it gets because you have to move data far farther, right? So you don't want the engine to be too big. You want it to be small enough to be efficient, but you want it to be too small because then the chunk of data it's working on isn't that interesting. So we picked a pretty good size of the what we call the Tensec processor. The processor is pretty pr programmable. It's really good at doing computation locally in memory and then forwarding the data from compute engine to compute engine in a way that's not software disastrous. And, and I've seen people say, oh, we just have this DMA engine and it's a program and you know, you write all this code and you know, and these guys just end up spend their whole life debugging corner cases. So we have a really nice abstraction in the hardware that says do compute when you need to send data, put the data in the pipe. You push it in the pipe, the other end pulls it out of the pipe. It's very clean, right? And that's resulted in a fairly small software team and software you can actually understand. So when I say it's promising, it's because they picked, got a whole bunch of things right. The compute engine's the right size. It actually natively does matrix multiplying convolution. Those aren't programs for threads, right? It natively does how to communicate data around. It's very good at keeping all the data on chip. So we're much more efficient on memory. We don't need HBM to go fast. So there's a whole bunch of things that do that. And then when we hook up multiple chips, the communication on chip and the communication chip to chip isn't different at the software layer, right? Physical transport's different, the on chip knock versus the ethernet pipe. But the hardware is built, so it's just sending data from this engine to this engine. And the software doesn't care, except for the fact that the compiler knows the latency and bandwidth here is a little different. But again, the abstraction layers are built properly, so you don't have to have three different software stacks. If you write on a, a GPU, you have to be a CUDA programmer in the thread, and then you have to coordinate the SM, and then on the chip, you have to do coordination, and then you have NVLink, which is a different thing, 
And then you have network, which is a different thing. And there's there's many different software layers. And if you have a thousand people and that's what you think is fun, that's cool. But if you just want to write AI programming and you don't want to know about, you know, all those different layers, like, like we, we have a plan that actually will work. And then we're doing some other interesting things with we're adding general purpose compute as part of the graph and future products. And we're 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 looking at like how do we make this really programmer friendly? What do the programmers want to yeah. do? And then, you know, how do we go meet them? Like hardware guys are you know, the, like I've done a lot of projects where you build the hardware and then software guys are like, that's not what I wanted. So we're trying to meet the software guys where they're at and they want to write code. They, and they want understand the, the hardware so they can drive it, but they don't want to be tortured by it. One of the things when I speak to AI companies is when they go from a, 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 a computation on chip to a computation multi-chip. Mm -hmm. You essentially have to break down your graph to be able to parallelize it across multiple chips. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like your the the design uh, the next generation wormhole design at least where you've got all these uh, you know 1600 gig ethernet connections off to mm -hmm. multiple chips. From the programmer perspective, it doesn't matter if they're working on one wormhole or 100,000. Mm -hmm. The compilation is the, and the software stack is still just the same. Yeah, well, we're actually building a 4U server box with 16 grayskulls in it, <clears throat> and they're connected with PCI Express Gen 4, and the compiler can actually break down a graph across those 16 parts. Right. Like, again, the yeah. software doesn't care if it transports PCI Express or Ethernet. Ethernet's more scalable in the big system, so we, we switched to Ethernet for the, the more scalable part. But we'll be able to take a, a training model and have it automatically compile down and break... The, the software will do the graph, not not the programmer. When you scale that to multiple chips, obviously you've got your 10, 6 cores per chip, and then you have to go off chip. There's obviously a latency penalty difference when you're moving data around there. How, how does that factor into your design when it comes down to these chips? And then from a software level, should the programmer care? Um. So here's the interesting thing about the computation, like matrix multiply in general is n cubed computation over n squared yeah. elements, right? And so basically as the footprint of the computation gets bigger, the, the ratio of bandwidth goes down, right? And, and we think we have the right ratio of bandwidth on wormholes so that the computation can be very effectively utilized on chip and the 16 ethernet port supports the communication between chips. And then, then the problem is the graph, like how do you decompose the problem and then how do you coordinate it? And that's, that's handled by our software stack. Like the programmer doesn't have to be involved in that. They can think more about how they want their model to look and, and, the, and the compiler takes care of how, to, how it gets arrayed out on the chips. So the, 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 the current Grayscale chip and the future Wormhole chip, they're kind of in this sort of, you know, 65, 75 watt boundary, and then you know, scale out to thousands, thousands of chips. Suddenly your communication across the whole array becomes a major part of the power discussion, right? Whereas mm -hmm. if you would have made, say, 300 watt chips, <laughs> you'd be able to keep more on die and less power would be wasted on communication. How do you marry the two between you know, having such, having a smaller chip, but a wider network array? Well, the uh, the actual Grayskull and Wormhole chips are actually fairly large. They're in Global Foundries 12. And yeah. uh, what are they, 650, 700 millimeters? 620 and 670s. Oh. Yeah. Right. And then Grayskull itself, we have a 75 watt card like that's you know the chip plus DRAMs and everything but we can also run that at 150 watts at a higher frequency higher voltage right and then the next generation when we do the shrink the computation we're raising the frequency quite a bit and the computational intensity goes up and we're, we're shifting to higher we'll have higher bandwidth interconnect so it's it's net a win but it's a slightly higher power form factor but it's still less than the you know the current gpu kind of roadmap and, and one of the things we do is since we keep most of the memory traffic on die, we don't need the high bandwidth memory, which has high power there. And then the Ethernet stuff, you know, you use power when you're communicating. And it really depends yeah. on the network how that's going to work. And 
we can do some dynamic power management. Like if the, the network ports are all pegged, we'll slow down the core a little bit to keep it balanced out. So the, the numbers on the quote spreadsheet all look pretty good, you know. Reality's fun because then you know, we go build this stuff and we'll learn a lot. I've, I've seen a lot of, you know, I expect that we'll get our ass kicked on a couple of things and we'll think, man, we wish we'd done this or that. But, uh, you know, the design and simulations we've done look pretty good, so. Is, is, isn't there always low hanging fruit with every ship design though? Oh yeah. Yeah. I've never done a project. <laughs> like I still remember I, I was one of the, Pete Bannon and I were the architects of UV5. And when we were done, it was the fastest microprocessor in the world. And I was, I was so embarrassed about what I did wrong. I could barely talk about it. Like I knew every single problem, but they still put it in the Guinness book of world's record. So yeah, <laughs> it's a funny, it's a funny phenomenon. Like when you're designing stuff, cause you're intimate with the details. So you, you talk about the cool stuff, but you you, you know everything, <laughs> like and it's always true, like there's there's no way around it. And and then the, the, those bits are the ones that you shouldn't tell the press about. <laughs> yeah. uh, I used to feel that way. Now I don't care. So I mean, it's um, I want I want to speak about next generation wormhole. It's you presented it recently at the um, or Tense Torrent presented it recently at the uh, Lindley conference. We're talking about a single chip with, uh, as I said before, 1,600 gig Ethernet ports and four ports on each corner of the chip built mm -hmm. out into this massive 2D mesh. Mm -hmm. You <sighs> Scale. I, I know we've spoken about scale going from you know, the hundreds to the millions. Is, is a 2D mesh still scalable out to the millions? Is that still relevant for AI workloads? Yeah, you, know, you want to take that? It's... Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's a it's a loaded question. I mean, it, it depends a lot on on ex on the the workload that you're you know that you're running and the the sort of prototypical mega workload of today is these transformer models. So stuff like GPT three, uh, GPT three probably is the the most famous you know member of the of that family right now. And uh, the, the the way people tend to to organize those is that it's it's basically a a, a bunch of replicated modules. So these modules uh, usually there's encoders and decoders. So there's two flavors of them, although they're very similar. And then there's just a stack of these, a, a long stack of them. So in a for a model like that, you can really take the two D mesh very very far. Right? And the the questions that uh, that our eyes are, uh, well, you know, how does the, the that module, that encoder, fit onto your hardware architecture? So usually for, for most other architectures that, that we have been watching, uh, you know, you want uh, pretty high bandwidth communication within the encoder or within the decoder. And then the, the bandwidth need on the boundary of these blocks is kind of more limited, let's say. Mm -hmm. So so what's emerged is uh, solutions where you'll have a, a shelf which is like a 2U or a 4U computer that you're gonna place, uh, or or a 6U, and you know, like in in the um, in in some cases. But bottom line is, you you have a computer and you map one of these blocks onto them, and then there will be network communication between these computers, and they coincide with the the edge boundaries there. So one of the messages we tried to to give it at Linley was that this need to to match the the encoder or decoder module to a computer is potentially detrimental. So it's a boundary that forces model designers to you know, ad ad adopt a certain set of sizings and a certain model architecture in order to fit the computer. So one of the things that we did is that we removed that boundary and we said, well, we have this you know, uniform grid. It's really large. You can basically place the entire pipeline onto that. There is no bandwidth cliffs. There's nothing that you really need to be super worried about you know, as, as you're designing models. So one of the big messages that the guys at Linley tried to give was that we attempted to unconstrain the model designers from this, you know, kind of limit of one box per one module of, of your model, which which has emerged. And um, so long as models don't change hugely, the 2D mesh, you know, abstraction is likely to hold up pretty well. Like the models themselves are 2D-ish. They're kind of left to right, more or less data flow. You you don't see a lot of random connections, kind of skipping around from the beginning to the end of the model and so on. 
And so long that holds, the 2D mesh is a pretty good substrate. Yeah, you know, there's a funny thing, like your brain is, I, I just read this recently, is, you know, your cerebral cortex is 1.3 square feet. And it's essentially, it's a flat, thin layer. It's, it's, it's six neurons high, but it's built out of these columns of about 100,000 neurons. And it's very uniform. So it's, it's a little 3D-ish. It's sort of like, you know, very big in two dimensions and six deep in the other dimension. And, you know, that's been stable for, you know, like hundreds of millions of years. <laughs> so There's also been hundreds of millions of iterations of getting it wrong, though. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. That's why, you know, we're iterating every year and, you know, we're going to be at this for a while. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. But, but there's, you know, the, the mathematics right now is being formulated as 2D matrices and the 2D mesh is natural for that. And the way the graph compilers, you know, partition stuff is pretty natural for it. And then, the, you know, the n cubed over n square works in our favor. But getting rid of the artificial boundaries, like you only have eight chips here, like we're building this really cool box with wormhole with, with a lot more chips in it. But it has enough bandwidth that we can then make that as part of a mesh going forwards. And then there's trade-offs about, well, what if one of the shelf breaks and how do you repair it? And like, how do you want to build the mesh? And people yeah. have lots of different opinions about that. And, and essentially at that level, we're flexible. But, um, but yeah, there's something powerful about meshes. And, you know, and then you got to do a lot of work on reliability and redundancy and rerouting. There's all kinds of interesting details on the, 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 the skins there. Uh, I mean, with, 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 with the 2D mesh, and it's great that you bring up, you know, this sort of six neuron high uh, mini 3D. Is there any desire roadmap you think on under AI compute to move to a more 3D style compute? Well, it would be natural for us because our tensor cores are actually big enough that they could do the local, you know, 3D a little bit. So if somebody wanted yeah. to say, I want this mesh to be a couple layers deep, like we could do that pretty naturally. Oh, if it cool. was full three-dimensional stuff, we'd have to really think about how the graph partition worked. But you can map a 3D thing onto a 2D thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, where, where, where do you see wormholes limits as the demands on AI grow? You know, is it localized SRAM, uh, compute per 10, six core bandwidth, or is it something else? That's a pretty good question. I mean, as, as things stand to today's crop of workloads, it's, it's pretty well balanced. Uh, it's somewhat difficult to predict, you know, what the, what, what's the first parameter that we're going to end up tweaking as, as things change? So between wormhole and grayscale, we've actually changed the, the mix of compute and memory in these cores. So we have more memory per core and we have more compute per, per core than before and, 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 and a little fewer cores. And uh, ultimately, that, that was kind of driven by just literally measurements. So what, what we're seeing is we compile workloads which have evolved like, you know, between the two chips. Uh, so, you know, your, your, your meta point is definitely true in that as, as, as the workload evolves, the right balance of compute to memory to, to IO bandwidth also is going to evolve. What exactly is going to change first? It's, it's kind of hard to, hard to predict, I think. So, so, so leading on from there, what's, you know, the future of tense hard designs, you're going from grayscale to wormhole to the next gen after that, I think, you know, J Jim alluded to more compute, more network interconnect. What's the direction here? So we, we just uh, announced with sci five that we're licensing their cores and we're gonna, on the next generation, put an array of processors there. And, and it's sort of for three things, you know, they can do local like network stack kind of stuff and, you know, smart neck behavior and, and some other things like that. And then they can run general purpose Linux and so, you know, you might want to just locally compute, you know, some kind of data transformation while you're doing it. <clears throat> but the interesting thing from an AI perspective is we can put bigger CPUs in the compute graph. And so as you're computing some, some result, you may say, hey, I want to run a C program on that. And it's bigger than what the, the RISC-V core can do locally. So we can give it to a bigger computer on the side. And again, it's just like, how do we give the programmers what they want? 
they want to do is they want to build models, they want to write code, they want it to work together. They don't want to have this kind of archaic, you know, it's an accelerator and there's a driver and this world is Linux and this world is something else. Like, like there's lots of boundaries in the software and we're, we're trying to limit that kind of stuff. So and we're, we're, we're doing it by adding general purpose compute and making sure that all the pieces work really well together. I think you actually pre you preempted me there because I was going to speak about you know your licensing of sci fives. Uh, is it the X two eighty core, five hundred twelve bit vector extensions? Yeah, yeah, it's there. Did yeah, it's, it has a nice big vector unit and has the right data types that we wanted for the AI computation. So you can you know send the, the dense sixteen bits load over there and it can compute it. And has a nice big vector unit and uh, they're doing a lot of work to make sure that you know if you if you write like reasonable vectorized code, it'll compile and run pretty well. And Chris, Chris Ladner's over at sci Five now, and he's one of the best, best compiler guys on the planet. And, you know, so it gave us some confidence about where that software direction is going to go. I think Risk 5 is really going to, well, it's already making huge inroads all over the place. Um, but with the next generation stuff with big vector units and really great software, um, Risk 5 is going to be pretty cool. You always take a, a die area hit implementing these extra, you know, compute risk five cores. Significant? Not. Well, our first one, no. We basically we have an array of processors. We're going to put a column in that's you know CPUs. So right. It's not big. It's it's a lot of general purpose compute, and you know part of what we're doing is you know we're evolving our our chip designs, and we're going to evolve our software stack, and we're willing to do experiments. Because you know this is a really fast-changing field, and we think this is uh, architecturally an interesting direction to go. Is 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 there any chance that part of your designs can be used in sort of like a mix and match? You can have a mesh of previous generation hardware and next generation hardware. Has that ever come up, or do you think customers in this space will just bulk change from one to the next? Uh, yeah, the. The soft or building the software to be as compatible as possible. So, you know, if you like Grayscale, when you go to Wormhole, you can build, you know, a 16 chip machine that works pretty similarly, but it scales better. And then when we go to the next chip, you know, all that software is going to work. But then if you want to add more functionality, you can do that. And if you do add more functionality, you want the new one. Um, it's also going to be, you know, the com computation intensity is going up, the network bandwidth is going up. Um, but you know, every every year you need a new competitive product. Um, but in the semiconductor world, you tend to sell parts for you know two, three, four years, right? Because as you go into production, the costs come down. You have a pricing strategy. Uh, so we 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 expect to keep selling, you know, the first generation, second generation. There's, you know, they're good solid parts. And but we'll we'll keep He's working on new features for the next the next round. I mean, it's t Tennis Torrent's currently, you know, partnered with Global Foundries um, for the first couple of chips. Still going with Global Foundries moving forward, or are you developing relationships with other foundries? Well, we we are developing relationships with other foundries, primarily due to desire to do some chips in the future in um, uh, even lower geometries than what we've been using. One of the um, one of the issues with uh, venture capital start uh, startup AI companies is the lack of a sufficient roadmap and the funding for that roadmap. How does Tens Torrent look from that front, from from say an investor perspective, right now? Uh, so, thinking in in terms of roadmap, let, let me just make sure I, I understood your question. So, the roadmap is referring to just basically our roadmap and. How does that intersect with our ability to to execute it from a purely financial standpoint, right? Sure. Yeah. 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 yeah so, so essentially, uh, our our roadmap has been interestingly kind of fairly static and consistent, like all, over the years. So we've we've been able to predict what we're going to do a few years out, and so far we've just been doing that. Luckily enough, we've also been able to, uh, you know, ac acquire the funds that were needed to to sustain it. So. Every, every time you, you, you could say that it's been roughly, you know, split up into these epochs, right? Uh, we talked about the basement thing and, the, you know, the, the office in the bad part of town. And 
uh, th th those kind of coincided with uh, with amounts of funding. After that, we moved into a you know a, a, an actual pro proper looking office. There was another epoch with another set of funding. That's that's when we did our first uh, our first trip, the test trip. So pretty much every trip coincided with a, with a round of funding, and in the first in the first couple of years that coincided with the move as well. Uh, we've uh, uh, we recently completed a fairly large round of funding, which we haven't quite, uh, uh, you know, publicized just yet. So, in fact, I think this is the first public conversation we're having ab about it. Uh, what I will say is that uh, it completely enables our, our roadmap for a couple of years. It enables our not only not only one but a couple of of, of our currently planned future trips. Uh, so, essentially. We're in a place where we should be able to deliver everything we're planning to deliver. And by that point, we're hoping that it's it's going to be self-sustaining. So that we... Yeah, no, I'll, I'll give you a, a number. We did a, a test chip and two production chips for $40 million. Wow. Right? And we have a great software team. It, it's, uh, you know, the genesis, the genesis of it is really interesting. We have people from FPJ World, AI, and HPC. Right, and uh, the combination of their, let's say, talents and insight, and then the hardware software match means that our software team is way smaller than anybody else's, and our software stack is way more effective and efficient. And so that saves us a boatload of money. We don't have to announce we're hiring 300 software people to make our hardware work because you know we made good architectural choices both at the software and hardware level. So that's made us effective. The the, the smaller geometry chips are more expensive to do by about two x, so yeah. it's going to raise our you know our burn rate a bit. But yeah, we have a pretty good we have pretty good line of sight to you know being profitable on the money we've already raised. So so we we feel pretty good about that, and that's partly because you know we've been efficient so far, and uh, we're not carrying around a big let's say technical debt on software or hardware. So I think that's, yeah. that's a pretty big difference from some other AI startups. So I have to ask, with Jim now being there for four or five months, um, especially as CTO, has he brought additional interest into the company? I mean, not only from the like of us plebs in the press, but, you know, investors, customers. Are you getting more calls just because Jim's there? Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's it's exactly the same across the spectrum. Uh, Jim has a lot of uh, he, he he has a reputation of somebody who both is uniquely able to kind of judge the quality of, of, of a technical solution uh, as as well as uh, understands how you actually bring it out to customers sell it go from a you know like technical product a technical concept and uh, and like you know an engineering proof of concept type story to something that's actually shipping in large volume. So I mean, it's it's been a very binary thing, like a zero to one, pretty much since he joined. Uh, we've been able to to kind of uh, get in the door much more easily at a whole variety of places, not uh, not only the press, but investors and customers as well, for sure. Yeah, I, I worked at two startups, Sidebyte and then PA Semi. I, I met literally oh. hundreds of customers. You know, like you know, selling. Uh, they were both network processors. You know, selling into embedded markets, but it's really a diverse space. And you know, I have a lot of experience of meeting with people and figuring out what they're actually doing, what they actually need, and then you know, finding out, figuring out, well, are we doing that? You know, and if we're not doing that, why aren't we doing it? What, what should we do about it? So it's it's been fun talking to I don't know how many people we've since I've joined. You know, 30, 40 different companies. And, you know, they're really diverse. You know, there's edge guys, there's autonomous guys, there's data center people, there's image processing, there's, you know, big cloud computation. Um, the space is really diverse. But they all come back to the same thing. Compute intensity, you know, the right amount of DRAM, the right amount of networking, software that works. They really want to be able to program stuff. We're talking to a couple of big companies who are frustrated with the current closed ecosystem and they're like, we're programming. We're a programming company. We want to be able to program the hardware, right? And and we're thinking, well, we want you to program the hardware too. What's the big problem? But there's lots of secrets in this business, and and so we're telling them what how our stuff works, and we're going to open up both the hardware and software specs quite a bit. 
and they're super excited about that. So, yeah, so we can get it's, the doors open, but the doors don't stay open unless you have something to say. And, so, I mean, is 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 ten ten star big enough to have the scope to work with you know a few very specific customers on their very specific <laughs> workloads? for the hardware because a big thing about ai companies is essentially assisting their customers with the hardware and helping them program it to get the best out of it where does tennis torrent sit there i think there, there's you know there, there's kind of two sides to that question one is uh you know, how how much kind of individual let's say so support and customization we can sustain and the other one is more of a technical architectural question that's uh how how sort of uh, resistant to to needing to be customized for for every given use case our particularly software solution is and and uh, when you peel the onion there that feeds all the way into hardware as the software doesn't exist in isolation but it's it's kind of like um, like Jim mentioned earlier we have a fairly small team uh, partly because we really didn't need a, a bigger to team to do what what we wanted partly because big teams are actually hard so you know managing a team of 300 people to be kind of effectively contributing to the same code base actually is something that not too many not too many people or places are are capable of so we we tried very very hard every step of the way to make our software such that it can be maintained by this small amount of people while still meeting the goals of you know that the world puts in front of us so one of the side effects of that is that uh, there's very little manual intervention that we expected when we built this thing when it comes to machine learning itself. So if you bring in a, a neural network that we haven't seen before, we try to make it such that the likelihood that we really need to do a bunch of manual tweaking is low. And then if we do need to do it, that it's it's easier, right? Like that it's something we can get done in a couple of days, not not have like a three month uh, you know burn on to have the team kind of story. So I think we've, yeah. we've materially succeeded there. So our software stack's pretty, uh, pretty well structured, pretty resilient to, you know, new, new workloads. Uh, and it's small. So like the, the, the sheer volume of it is, is low. So we're, we're talking about, you know, a 50,000 line kind of, kind of product, not, not, not a 5 million line one. Uh, so that makes it a bit easier. Uh, on the other hand, there, there's still a bunch of individual work to do. So people usually want to integrate these into existing software stacks, into into solutions that span more than machine learning. So, for example, you know, you have video coming in on a camera. Usually, whoever wants to buy an inference engine for that video, they want an integrated pipeline, right? So they, they want video coming in over IP, something decoding it, feeding it into us, decorating it with, you know, boxes or conclusions, re-encoding it potentially kind of connecting to to uh, payment platforms, all sorts of, you know, ancillary stuff that's completely unrelated to, to machine learning. So for this sort of thing, we are we are building up, uh, you know, a, a team internally to support this sort of work. Uh, and that's kind of part of the solution. And we'll certainly be able to to sustain this kind of work with, with a few large customers. But on the long term, uh, you really need to build up an ecosystem of collaborators uh, for this kind of thing. So, like, I, I don't think even a, e even the the heavyweight companies in the space actually pull all of this by themselves. Usually, it's a bit of an ecosystem building uh, exercise, and you know we have that in our plans. But it's it's sort of a step by step thing. First, you really crush the machine learning workload, convince everybody that you know like uh, that, that you've done that and you have something great, and then. Then you kind of throw a lot of effort into building an ecosystem. So yeah. and, all of that's still coming down the pipe. Yeah, we want to scale the you know the support end of it, not the core compiler side. Like yeah, if, if we do that part right, you know that should be a, a really good tight team. And you know I, I saw this you know at Sidebyte, you know there was three operating systems we had to support: the Cisco operating system, Linux, and Wind River. And then we had a set of drivers on top of that. And once we nailed that picture, lots of different people could do all kinds of stuff because board support once the board support package was there, them adding their own software on top of that platform was pretty straightforward. We had 100 customers with a small support team. 
But until we figured out that, I mean, the mechanics of the pieces, it seemed complicated because everybody seemed to want something different. But, but once you got the abstraction layer right and the right operating system and the right set of drivers, then a lot of people could do different things with it. So, so uh, speaking of personnel, um, at AMD, Jim was the boss and Labija was part of Jim's team. This time around, it's Labija's the CEO and Jim's, Jim's the underling. <laughs> How is, how, how's, that dyma- how's that dynamic worked? Is it better, worse? How's it, how's it come across day to day? Well, it's, it's, it's a, th- th- that's n- not uh, an accurate pr- portrayal of, of the way we have it set up. So we, we, we've been kind of, uh, we, we've agreed to, to, to do this thing as partners for the most part. Uh, and that's how we've been doing it for, for the most part. So Jim's certainly not an underling to me. Uh, mm. In reality, if anything, uh, uh, you know, Jim, Jim, Jim's somebody that's senior to me in every way, you know, conceivable. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think it's uh, it's it's cool that we're doing this in partnership, but really, like, you know, if if, if anybody's kind of taking direction at points of ambiguity, it's me. So, well, yeah, I'd say it's really all that different. Labija ca- created Tenstorn, and, and his team, you know, his original founders, and then the core team, there's some really great people there. And we talked a lot about what we should do, and you know, and I think it would be absolutely great if we IPO and Labija's CEO, and you know, I'm supporting that, you know, 100. percent And we get along really good. We talk every day, and there's some things we divided and conquered. Like he's been really focused on the software stack, and I was focused on the the next generation part and the CP we're picking. There's a bunch of architectural features that we we kind of work. We get together and we talk about it, and we say, all right, you do this, I'll do that. And so far, that's been working really well. There's some business stuff that I've been focused on a lot more um, because I'm really interested in how this is going to go together and go to market. So, but yeah. And like with investors, we mostly both talk to them. Then that's pretty good. And we we cover different areas. So, you know, so far, so good. So, I mean, that's uh, that's actually quite good because it leads on to me asking Jim exactly what you've been doing there for, you know, the four, four or five months. Cause at the point you joined wormhole was already in the process of, I guess, going to fabs being taped out, I guess, mm-hmm. or at least in the final stages of design. Um, so in my well, mind, okay, you're working on next been gen- back for, for a while and it's up and running. It's beautiful. So well, there you go. It, it's it, in my mind. Then that means that you're working on the next generation and the generation after that, but now you're telling me you're doing a lot of the business side as well. <laughs> right? Yeah. But, I, yeah, I like context, which is like... Jim's a great sales guy. Like I, yeah. I always figured him to be a per- persistent, uh, you know, a persistent dude and somebody that knows technology called. But uh, f- frankly, I was surprised by, you know, like uh, his kind of level of com- comfort in these meetings with customers. No, like like I was at two startups where we had a really good team. We had a, a guy who could get all the doors open. We had me was kind of talking about architecture. We had a software guy. We had a system board guy. And we just had a team. We'd go talk to people and go solve their problems. And when you do that, you learn a lot. Like, that's the thing I like. It's like, oh, that's what you're doing with our chip. Holy crap. You know, we weren't thinking about that at all. So, you know, like I, I've been told at various points in my career, you know, I said focus on that. You know the high level picture managing it but i always like to get into the details because that's where you learn everything and then you integrate that together and then do something with it so talking to customers is fun especially if they're smart and you know they're trying to do something new and so i, I like to do that kind of stuff but i also i like to work in partnerships i you know like pete bannon and i've been working together on and off for 30 years and you know, we worked on vax 8800 ev5 we worked at Tesla, a PA Semi, and then Tesla, Apple, Jesus, you know, how many places? You know, Dirk Meyer and I worked on at Digital and AMD together for years. You know, I, I play pretty well with others, you know. So okay. it's only recently that I found myself being like the VP. Raj and I worked together. He was at AMD and I was at Apple. We worked together. And then he came to Apple and then I went to AMD. And then he went to AMD and he went to Intel and then I went to Intel. So, you know, we've, we've worked on a whole bunch of projects together. So I'm pretty used to, I would say, intense intellectual collaboration. You're sort of good at different things. Like, 
Like Dirk was way better at execution and details, and I would come up with crazy ideas, and you know, he would look at me like, I don't know why you want to do that, but I'll try it, you know. And you know, we had a lot of fun, you know, doing stuff. I wrote the hyper transport spec, and the original spec was like 16 pages. And I sent it to Dirk, and Dirk said, Jim, I know how you think. You mind if I fill in a few details? And like three days later, I got a 60 page spec back that actually looked like something a human being could read. And it, it was like 100% right, because he actually did know how I thought, but he also knew what people needed to see in a spec. And, uh, you know, so I, I like that kind yeah. of stuff. It's, re it's really fun. I, it's, uh, I, I think you have cultivated that image of mad, mad technical scientists. Yeah. Let's try a bunch of stuff. It, yeah. So somebody else can fill in the det details, but let's fill in a bunch of stuff. I mean, yeah. how often these days do you find yourself actually in the nuts and bolts of, of the design versus that more sort of All holistic roadmap? All, All the time. time. Yeah, I, I got, <laughs> I don't want to go into too many details, but when I was at Intel, people were surprised the senior VP was gr grilling people on how they managed their batch queues to run to the grid or what the PDK, you know, qualification steps were or how long the CAD flows took to run, you yeah. know, and like, or what the dense utilization was in the CPU and, or how the register file was built. Like, like I knew details about everything. And, you know, and I care about them. Like, I actually really care, you know, and I want them to look good. A friend of mine said, if it doesn't look good, it isn't good. Like, so when you look at the layout of a processor or, you know, how something's built, it's got to be great. And you can't make it great if you don't know what you're doing. You can't, you know, if somebody gives you like the five level abstraction PowerPoint slide that says things are going good and we're improving things by 3%. Like I've been in meetings where somebody said it's 5% better. And I said, better than what? Better than last year, better than the best possible, better than your first grade project. And they literally didn't know what, you know, they'd been putting 5% better on the slide for so long, they forgot what it was. So yeah, you have to get the details. If you're, you know, going to be in the technology business in any way, shape or form, and you can't get to the details. And I thought I was good at that. Then I met Elon Musk. Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> for him, the details started at Adam's. Maybe, yeah. maybe lower, I don't know, but like, like what he thinks is first, what I thought it was first principle thinking wasn't close to first principle thinking. And I got my ass kicked seriously about, you know, doing that. And it, it was really great. You know, I, I really like to do that. And, and then I hope when I engage with engineering teams, they kind of, they start to get that, oh, the engineering's fun and the details matter. And, you know, there's an abstraction stack. There's the high level, there's medium, you know, and there's a low level. And yes, you do need to know a lot about all of them because then you can figure out how to fix things. You can't fix a computer too slow. Like that's not, a, you can't fix that. What are you going to do if it's too slow? But you could go into like, like a thousand details and there's all kinds of stuff to do if you know the details. So it's, yeah. it's I, I, I'm surprised that people would wonder why you're asking detailed questions about, you know, register file and, you know, cash use and whatever because this is stuff that you've been doing for so long that that, that well, kind, of, kind of seems weird to me it's almost as if the person you were speaking to didn't know who you were yeah yeah but the, the positions get associated you know somebody you know my team at intel was ten thousand people right and so you spend a lot of time on org charts and budgets and all kinds yeah of stuff. and then it's easy to find yourself just doing that and saying well i'll hand off the leadership of this project to this person this person and and that, but the problem is there's so many things that are cross-functional, like, like what's the fab doing? How's the PK work? How's the library work? How's the IP team work? How's the SOC integration work? How's the performance model work? How's the software work? And then you find out if, if you can't deep dive into all those pieces, bad things happen. My, my father worked at GE when Jack Welsh ran GE. And he said he could, he could go to any part of GE and within a day get to the bottom of it. Like, like he got credited with a whole bunch of business innovation, but like I heard from many people, he could get to the bottom of anything. And I read his book straight from the gut years ago. And I thought, well, I'd like to be that kind of, you know, if I'm going to manage people, I'd like to be that kind of person to get the bottom of anything. So, I mean, you've been, it's, it's well known that you've been bouncing from company to company to company every That's few years. True. That's a myth. <laughs> 
that's <laughs> that 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 is the general perception. So it means. So I I, I have to ask, um, um, because because uh, Lubisha uh, alluded to your age earlier as yeah. being more senior. Um, is Tens Torrent your your final home? I'm going to be for here forever, <laughs> but I am, I probably will have a few other things going on. And uh, you know, I was talking. I'm talking to some friends about a quantum, you know, a qubit company, which I think is yep. hilarious. And then I have, I have a couple other friends where we've been brainstorming on how to do a new kind of semiconductor startup, like that's like a million times cheaper than the current stuff. And there's there's other stuff I'm interested in, but you know, like Tenstorrent, like our mission is to go build AI for everyone. And you know, build programmable chips that people can actually use, and that's it's a many year effort. So, so uh, will, will will you ever retire? Um, I read a book somewhere that it's from retirement to death is ten years, and I will live to be a hundred. So <laughs> I'll retire at ninety, I guess. You know, it's it, you hear that, Lubisha? You've got Jim until he's ninety. So that sounds great. Yeah. Not to say it's not a surprise. We, we haven't discussed this, but if you asked me, I would have said some, something similar. You know, yeah, on his you know I, I like to do stuff. You know, I, I snowboard with my kids and I go kite surfing in Hawaii. And, you know, I like to run and you know, goof around. Like, I, you know, I have lots of stuff to do, but I like to work and I like technology. So, and it's really interesting. It's amazing. You know, periodically people think, well, this, the, this is the end of this or the end of that. And, Holy cats! You know the AI revolution is bigger than the internet, and it's going to change how we think about everything, how we think about programming, how we think about computing, how we think about graphics, images, all kinds of stuff. So, yeah, it's a it's a really interesting time to be part of technology. Is there anything about Tens Torrent that you want people to know that hasn't really been discussed anywhere? Well, we're hiring. So if people want to, you know, I really love people, engineers who love to do stuff that are really hands-on. I hired a bunch of senior CPU guys. And, you know, the first thing they did is they started bringing up the DB infrastructure and building a model and getting to the bottom of it. So, you know, if you want to, you know, manage a bunch of people and sit around making PowerPoints, please don't apply to us. But if you're a technologist and you want to, you know, be hands-on and do real work, that's great. Or if you're young and you know smart and you want to work hard and learn something from really good people, do it. Like, well, how many people, like on the team that built Grayskull, was it we built a 700 millimeter world-class AI chip with 15 people? That's right. Like, it's unbelievable. Like, so if you want to learn how to build stuff, this would be a good place. So send us your resume. They finally prodded me to join LinkedIn. I don't really know how that works, but they tell me that's going to help me connect with people and hire. Like, no, it really fun. doesn't. It doesn't. I don't know. I don't. No, the thing I really like is it keeps saying, hey, you, your network says you know this person. I was like, oh, I worked with him a couple of years ago. He was great. So I sent him a message. Hey, you want to come work with us? So, now it's been kind of fun. You know, it's like a little memory lane walk for me because how the algorithm works. Is, but, but yeah, I'm not a social media person at all. I just I like to nerd noticed. out stuff and then then talk about things. And I think I've sent out like three tweets in my whole life. It's pretty fun. I mean, uh, you, you guys are in Toronto, Austin, and the Bay Area right now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we just any, got. Any... Uh, we take a brand new office in uh, Santa Clara, ten thousand square feet. It's beautiful. And we have an offer in on a, a new office in, in Austin, which is going to be great. I like having a really nice place to work. When I go to work, I want it to look good. I still remember when I went to Apple, it was hilarious. They changed the font on the, the one of the Mac manuals. So they repainted the fonts on all the signs around the campus to match. It was like that attention to detail just cracked me up. But it was a really nice place to work, and it was cool. So... So yeah, we have three offices, which are all going to be nice places to work. In in one of the diagrams in one of the presentations, you have uh, you know a rack of wormholes, and then you have another rack of wormholes, and the idea is that you span out to multiple racks of wormholes, all connected by a hundred gigabit Ethernet. We're talking you know a hundred connections rack to rack. Mm -hmm. 
at what point does the cost of the cables become more than the cost of the chips? Because those cables are expensive. We're not there yet, but <laughs> but I'll tell you that like you know we had a. Jim made a funny remark when we when we reviewed the wormhole system a couple of weeks back, where you know in the wormhole systems we don't have any any host processors, so there isn't an Intel chip or an AMD chip in there, you know, run running kind of Linux. So Jim Jim looked at the the bomb cost for the machine and he goes, "Well, I guess we cut out the processor cost, but we replaced it with cables." <laughs> yep. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, they're, they're a non-trivial piece of the of the cost mm. at this point, but they're, they're still very far from, from, you know, like reaching the, the level that the machine learning processors are at. Yeah. And that's one reason why, you know, power and density really matter. We're building this really dense for you box, partly to save cables. Yeah. Um, so, so it, de- it definitely matters. It's first order on the flip side, man, the, the networking has gotten better. Like I remember when we we're struggling like crazy to get from, to get to 10 and then to 20, 25, I guess, gigabits a second. And we've we've raced through 50, 100, 400 because of signal processing on on the wires and, you know, just a whole bunch of technology innovation. So, so yeah, network bandwidth has is, is gone up a lot. And it's amazing this layer two transport layer somehow worked at 100 megabits and it's still a pretty good answer at 400 gigabits. So it's, it's, it's a really interesting technology. When you nail the abstraction layer, how far it can go. You know, I always joke that they must have changed a lot of physics because I remember when 100 megabits was a bitch. And, you know, and now it's, you know, 400 gigabits. You know, it's well, just... I mean, it's a, a few companies have been saying that the future is, you know, along the integrated silicon photonics line. But mm-hmm. the companies that are doing that obviously have multi billion dollar budgets. Yeah, right. Yeah. Photonics has been the thing we're going to have to go to in five years for 20 years. And it's another one of those interesting phenomena. Um, yeah, it's it's harder to build, and then uh, the pace of innovation on copper has been spectacular. So, is, is is something like that viable for a startup like Tens Torrent? Do you think moving in that direction, if you, if you needed to move economy. down to it? Yeah. Well, the, the first version of it'll be when is it better in the rack to use photonics than copper? Not not whether it has to go to the chip. And the answer still is depends on how far you're going, how much bandwidth you have. But you're starting to do the top of rack, you know, mega pipes with with photonics. But you know, the wire the wires in the rack are still all copper, and economics are really clear. And the and, and tens torrent designs don't really need that top of rack switch anyway. So depends on how people want to build it. Some people will build it that way. Yeah. It's an interesting, yeah, it's one of those static things. It's like people said Moore's Law is dead in 10 years. When I realized they'd been saying that for 20 years, I decided to ignore it or at some point investigate why people had that belief for such a long period of time. And it, it's, yeah. it's actually biblical, apocryphal stuff. The world's always going to end in 10 years because that's when the diminishing return curve burns out. But, they say, yeah. I think the world only ends in 10 years when you decide to retire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's definitely true, apparently. Thanks, guys, for your time. Uh, Jim, Lubija, you know, good luck with uh, Tense Torrent in the future. And I look forward to uh, seeing some, some more presentations in some of the conferences going forward. When, when that uh, really dense for you uh, wormhole box comes online, you got to let me have a look. Okay, great. Hey, thanks. Cool thing. Thanks, Ian.